Okay. Um, so as Mullen said, um, this talk is titled Public Space Crawl. But um, to explain the title of the talk uh, a bit further, privatized public space is a topic that Maddie and I have been interested in for several years now. And it was actually the subject of a summer school unit that we taught together in 2015 at the uh, Architectural Association. And it looked at the pub as an example of uh, a positive example of privatized public space. And so um, for the original walking tour that we planned with the Architecture Foundation, we wanted to appropriate the format of the pub crawl as a means to visit a series of privatized public spaces. And while this has now been postponed until later this year, um, this talk begins to explore some of these themes that we hope we can discuss um, on the crawl when it takes place. So um, our definition of privatized public space is a space that is publicly accessible but privately owned. Um, and whilst that may seem obvious, uh, people often think of privatized public space purely as paved squares and new developments. Um, but we're interested in how it um, sort of encompasses much more than that. Uh, so from the high street, which is often regarded as the backbone of all UK towns and cities to interior spaces like the pub, which serves as everything from the extension of your living room to the modern day public toilet, privatised public space has been historically embedded in British culture for generations. And many of these spaces are under threat as our cities are increasingly shaped by financial pressures. As retail has shifted online, shops on the high street have been closed and left vacant, leaving a void in the centre of communities. And likewise, pubs have closed up and down the country as they're converted into more profitable high-end residential uses. Um, and so these spaces are more, even more under threat now uh, than ever before with the evolving situation around COVID-19, where small business owners along the high street and pub landlords aren't sure if they'll be able to reopen uh, once this is all behind us. Um, so we think this is actually like an increasingly pressing topic to be engaging with. So our proposal for the 2020 British Pavilion takes inspiration from Hieronymus Bosch's painting, The Garden of Earthly Delights, which uses the format of a triptych to show the utopia of the Garden of Eden or heaven on one side, and then the dystopia of hell on the other side. And then the subject matter of the painting, which is the middle ground of earth, is framed in the center of these um, two side panels. So um, to start developing our concept, we uninhabited Bosch's painting, um, which both revealed the tradition of the English landscape, but also showed how devoid of life um, these kinds of generic green spaces in the middle of cities can be when you remove all traces of inhabitation, such as people and programming. Um, so to start our um, concept for the pavilion, we then re-inhabited the painting and interpreted the triptych as um, a kind of middle ground that sits between the kind of utopia of the commons before the Enclosures Act of the 18th century um, on the left, and then on the right, the dystopia of total pri privatization, which is what we seem to be heading towards. And then the middle ground um, addresses the creeping epidemic of privatized public space across cities in the UK as an urgent opportunity to create more inclusive programmed and inhabited spaces. So we wanna challenge the polarization of private and public as a tool to create divisions within society. Instead, we ask how can architects work with the public to invent new frameworks to improve use, access and ownership of Britain's public spaces. As the overall theme for the Biennale asks, how will we live together? Planning the future of these spaces becomes a complex but crucial conversation that needs to happen between multiple stakeholders. Um, so the rapid increase of privatized public space within the UK has frequently been problematized, but very little has been done to address its root causes. Um, this series of maps by Guy Shrubsall and Anna Powell Smith is part of a wider research project titled Who Owns England? And it aims to give greater transparency around the ownership of land. So as you can see by all the red um, areas on this map, when they started the project, only around 50% of all land was documented on the land registry's website. And now it's around 85%, but there are still around 5.2 million acres that still need to be registered. And even where land is registered, it's often not attributed to a particular owner. So here um, on the zoomed in section on the right, you can see that um, we can hover over different areas and it'll tell you like who actually owns uh, these spaces. And it's often foreign investors or um, big corporations. And they've found this out through a kind of almost like detective like process of trying to uncover who actually owns this land. And um, just over a month ago, the Greater London Authority launched the Public London Charter as part of the London Plan, which sets out the rights and responsibilities for owners, users and managers of privately owned public spaces. 
So we sh like kind of showing these kinds of references to show that this is a topical discussion that everyone can engage with and be a part of at the moment. Um, and at around the same time um, as the Public London Charter launch, we released a series of films uh, with the British Council shot within privatised public spaces in the UK. And um, we'd encourage you to watch these afterwards if you haven't already. They're all available on the British Council's website and um, they sort of show more about the topics that we're exploring and the research that we're developing. Um, and we've been working with an amazing team of collaborators to realize this project um, for the British Pavilion, including a series of practices to develop each of the rooms in the pavilion who include the decorators, uh, built works, studio polpo, public works and BPPR, as well as a wider team of consultants, including Arup and Bureau Happold. So the pavilion asks, how can we rethink what public space can be? And we're exploring different themes of privatized public space across the rooms of the pavilion. So spaces under threat like the youth centre and inaccessible enclaves like the Garden Square are overlaid with proposals for how they can be reprogrammed and revitalised. Added to these are two proposed spaces for new government ministries advocating for a more bottom-up approach as to how we can understand the ownership of either land or data. And the main room of the pavilion addresses the Garden Square, a space in the city that is usually highly controlled or locked, often sitting unused and tantalisingly out of reach to users by. With defensive high railings around them, the squares are seen as an exclusive typology that is only available to those with a key. And our design exposes the problem of access to public green spaces in our cities. So with limited access to outdoor space, how can we open up exclusive garden squares to allow more diverse users and activities to be introduced? As a pre predominantly Georgian typology, garden squares are found both in London, but also in other cities like Bristol, Bath, Edinburgh and Leeds. Um, this taxonomy of squares is organized by location versus degrees of access. And um, types of squares can include anything from private squares to public squares, communal gardens, circuses, fields, crescents, and many more other typologies. And although some of these have been opened up to the public, many are still private, which is a problem because it gates off secluded spaces in the center of cities that a lot more people could actually enjoy. Um, our strategy in kind of looking at this space and going forward is to transform these exclusive spaces into one that are both more inclusive and productive. And so our proposal for this room, the Garden of Delight, looks at how we can intervene through providing spaces for more diverse users and activities to be introduced to the square. So by opening up these gardens, the square could be privately managed and publicly used to construct new hybrid models of ownership. And projects that have shaped the future of the Garden Square and have influenced our design include Phantom Railings by Catalina Pollock-Williamson, which explores the origins of enclosed green space, as well as um, kind of more fantastical projects like Log Plug and Rock Plug, um, which were two designs by David Green of Archigram, which hybridized nature and technology to suggest more mobile and temporal ways of living in the landscape. Our research also reveals that many of the railings around garden squares were removed during the Second World War to be melted down and converted into ammunition. However, the quality of the iron was not good enough, so they were never actually used in this way. But the act of removing the railings led to many squares being opened up to the public, which boosted morale and brought different groups of people together. However, when the war ended, many of the squares were re-enclosed, making them private once again. There are many articles from that time praising this move as a democratic, gest uh, democratic gesture and the advantages of having spaces that allow people from different backgrounds to come together. As George Orwell wrote in the Tribune in 1944, many more green spaces were now open to the public and you could stay in the parks till all hours instead of being hounded out at closing time by grim face keepers. It was also discovered that these railings were not only unnecessarily unnecessary but hideously ugly. The parks were improved out of recognition by be being laid open, acquiring a friendly, almost rural look that they had never had before. So um, hopefully this presentation has given you an overview of how we would, how we've been exploring privatised public space. Um, and we thought that this archival image of Bedford Square as a pre photoshop collage, imagining what the square would look like if the railings were removed, could be a good way to start the conversation um, now, going forward. Um, and at a time of self-isolation and social distancing, when access to public space is so limited and gates and railings are creating pinch points, this topic and the value that we place on public space feels more important than ever before. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks to you both.
And and of course, um, I just to re just to remind everybody that um, we have the chat box. So do type in uh, your questions in the chat box, and uh, and I can find you and unmute you so you can join the conversation. So we'll try and we'll try and keep it uh, a little bit of uh, order to it. Um, that was absolutely fascinating presentation, and I'm, I'm uh, really looking forward to the public space crawl when we actually eventually get to do it. Uh, so surely we're going to visit some squares and some pubs, so it's going to be really fun. Um, I mean, this, the, the topic of the garden squares, I know obviously there is a big, a broader issue with um, privatised space, but just on the, the garden squares, I mean, right now yourselves, um, how, are you, how are you getting out and enjoying public spaces? Are you, are you wishing that uh, Bedford Square, for example, outside where you teach, was was wide open and fully accessible. Uh, are you are you able to access parks like Victoria Park, for example? And how's it affecting how you feel right now? I think um, I guess at the moment, like uh, people are using outdoor spaces in some ways more than they used to, but in very solitary ways. Um, I think, for example, Bedford Square isn't a space I have access to right now because it's too far away from where I live. But um, I think it's something that's an interesting example because a lot of the um, the inhabitants that surround the square, while they originally might have been residential, are now more cultural institutions. And so it brings into question why some a space like that should still be enclosed and whether the fact that like a thousand people at the AA have access to that, does that mean that it's already kind of public in a way, so it should just be opened up further? Um, and uh, I think... Is it, there is an issue right now with public space in terms of people wanting to use it but not being able to um, come together within it because of the reasons around the COVID-19 situation and it not being safe. Um, and actually, as Maddie said in the closing point, like the, the railings and gates, these like physical barriers are actually um, causing more harm than good in terms of um, like kind of causing these pinch points to exist. Does it encourage you the fact that this seems to become becoming a bit of a political point now? I mean, it, for example, in uh, South London, there's a uh, Harriet Harman MP has been calling on golf courses and public schools to throw open their gates. Um, it seems rather like uh, sometimes in in Britain, at least, our attitudes to public space are often sort of morally influenced, and right now there's a kind of moral panic around people being close together the premium on space and as a result um, that's forcing a kind of change in the way that public space is 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 valued yeah I, th I think that's a really good point and i think as well the emphasis on how important it is to have access to outdoor space um and the fact that yeah you can't so you suddenly can't access it or there isn't enough of it and um i think yeah i think you're, you're completely right like it is really interesting that it's suddenly being put at the forefront um, but at the same time, something we've really found um, during our research is that a lot of people have the same ambitions, no matter what standpoint they're coming from, whether it's from legislation, developer, architect, planner, general public, a lot of people do want to see these spaces opened up, but they just don't understand how, like, how do you begin to open them up? And uh, something which we think is really important is having this kind of conversation across different disciplines with different people to try and figure out how we go about that. So it's really interesting that these politicians are speaking about it. And yeah, perhaps there is an opportunity there to start engaging with them, to start seeing how we can make this happen um, sort of both bottom up and from a policy level. Do you find that this is a phenomenon that mostly affects stuff that is privately owned and public? Or are there examples of public sector developments, for example, something like the Olympic Park, which also have this problematic relationship with public space? Because I say something, somewhere like that, it, I mean, it seems pretty public, but it doesn't quite seem as public as walking through, um, you know, Tooting Common or Hampstead Heath or something like that. There's a kind of feeling that there's, there's CCTV and there might be more, of, more restrictions on your behaviour. Yeah, I think it's because of um, maybe understanding the complexity of who owns space. So even a project like that, that is supposed to be public, there's a lot of private security that monitors that. Um, there's a lot of restrictions over what you can do that isn't always clear. Um, so a lot of what we're trying to do with the project is think about like, how do we create signage that actually gives people um, a better sense of what they can do in public space rather than always talking about what they can't do. Um, how do we make ownership clearer so it's not only when you violate the terms 
the kind of invisible or hidden terms by which you're occupying a space um, that you discover that it's owned by somebody like in the Occupy protests in Paternoster Square where they discovered that the Mitsubishi Corporation owned it only after they tried to protest on that land. So um, what are the ways we can actually make that a much more transparent conversation? And rather than limiting activity, we're actually thinking of how we enable new forms of interaction and activity on those spaces. Yeah, I think a, a really big part of what we're doing is looking at that transparency of ownership. And if you, you know, you see if you want to do something, um, I don't know, like create a festival or something or, or hold an event in a, in a local park, like how, who do you even go to to do that? Like, how do you even know the next steps to take? Um, and so we're really interested in that kind of transparency and how do you um, how do you sort of communicate that to people, give them the tools to be able to sort of reclaim these spaces and, and turn them into spaces that they, they would like to see and use. And of course, as you point out quite well, huge amounts of land aren't really owned by anybody. So you're asking permission of somebody who sort of has a kind of artificial right to tell you yes or no, but it's not really, it's not, it's not really a real thing. Um, I mean, do you find that in a process like this, is it pretty straightforward to be able to plug into the existing political systems that exist? Because, because surely you know, things like local government, national government, they're supposed to be coordinating the shared uh, occupation of space. That is the origins of politics in human society. Is this a straightforward thing or are you actually discovering that most of these things are totally deficient? I think there's... There's some things that are happening right now. That's why we mentioned like the Public London Charter, because it's the first kind of attempts to start to regulate what privatized public space um, is, rather than just leaving that as a kind of gray area that sits between public sector and private sector. However, that's coming at it from a policy standpoint rather than a design standpoint. And it's important that, I mean, we really feel like architects have a role to play in kind of facilitating a wider conversation that brings together the different people that are involved in the making of these spaces. So you use the Olympics as an example, like while there was a lot of consultation in the community that existed there before the Olympics, how much those people were actually listened to or how much that kind of all the new programs that were brought to Stratford actually um, impacted the people who already lived there is questionable. And so what are kind of better ways we can actually do a meaningful consultation? I think um, a lot of what the project what the pavilion is trying to do is just to ask questions. Um, I don't think that either of us claim to have all the answers, but we want to try and use this as a platform to to kind of work with the public, to work with different people already involved around the table, to come up with better strategies of how the public sector and the private sector can work together. It, it certainly seems like in recent years there's a kind of aesthetic of public space and this aesthetic addresses these fears that society has. So if you look at something like the Olympic Park, it has all this meadowland and kind of scrub that reminds you of the wastelands and the weird bits that were demolished to make way for the Olympics. Garden squares like Bedford Square themselves were uh, meant to represent the countryside, the kind of bucolic landscape that had been a, a landed estate that had then been turned over to property speculation. And when we come to like big, big, big property development run right now, it's like a kind of business park on steroids. So rather than the weird little indestructible shrubs of green matter, we've got this kind of authenticity landscape and this kind of landscape of interactivity and actions. And you see that in places like, for example, the Battersea Power Station development, or you see that, for example, in King's Cross. You certainly don't see it on the Olympic Park. That's pretty empty. Um, but is, is there a risk that as architects, as designers, we kind of fall into a bit of a trap where our aesthetics end up sort of just, just addressing an existing process, an existing fear? Or, or can we move beyond that? Maybe yeah, I'm part of the, Sorry, Maddie, go. go. There you go, it's fine. Um, I think maybe part of the problem is that um, at the moment, like when we talked about this misconception that privatized public space is often... Um, thought of as like a gated a, a gated square or a paved square. I think too often through things like Section 106, the, um, the provision of public space through private developments tends to be a one size fits all rather than it actually being specific to what a local community needs or referencing. Um, and we've had some conversations um, with private landowners in the process of some of the policy around this. So rather than providing 
generic public space introducing things like petitions or libraries instead of more squares, which space can be a detriment as no one attached to attain them, or it could used to be this generic or a space without really thinking of who uses that, what would I use? Okay. Um, so I think I, we've, we've certainly got a lot of really cool questions uh, in the chat box. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, and there's one that relates to what you just said. It's by Steve Porter. So I'm going to unmute Steve. Steve, are you there? Yeah. Hi. Good afternoon. Um, would you like to ask your question, please? Yeah, I just wonder whether um, uh, Dave looked at the sort of legal liabilities of, of owners of these spaces and, and how that uh whether or not that's a stumbling block to opening these spaces up for for wider public use because obviously there's um you know we, we live in litigious times and uh you know people don't really need a uh, an excuse for suing somebody for something or other even if it is their own silly fault so i just wonder whether or not that's something that they've uh, they've investigated yeah, I think it's a it's a really good point because um, sometimes it can be easier to do nothing than to start to open up spaces and really engage with this. And um, I think that's something that's happened all too often up till now. Like people have had ideas of what they'd like to do, but then they're a bit too risk adverse to go that step further. Um, and I think something we found is like actually, particularly like the public sector can actually be really risk adverse. Um, as, as well as the private sector, like they, they both have um, problems with that. And I think that's why we were really interested by things like the public space charter, which are looking at how do you start to um, have some kind of regulation over these spaces so that people start to know what it is they can do with them. Um, and I, yeah, and that's why we're so interested in the legislation behind them and how do we encourage people to engage with these spaces and to sort of share the risks and, um, to sort of test these spaces and realize the opportunities that there are to um to have fun with them okay um is that is that okay steve okay. i'm going to take okay yeah, I'm that's gonna... great. thank you very much okay um so we've got um as in, do keep the questions coming because they're really good so we've got a question from somebody who can't actually read it out loud themselves but effectively it's a bit of a philosophical one they're saying uh, what assumption are you making about having a legitimate claim to these these private land? I mean, I can certainly answer that from an anarchic perspective, uh, while also acknowledging their contribution to our city as a form of amenity. And and the and the, um, this is from Y M Lamb. Sorry, I didn't mention the name. And also, uh, they they further uh, in another question further develop that to basically say. Um, you know, we, we, we got to acknowledge these things and then lay claim to them because effectively what you're, they argue, is there a risk that what you're proposing could, could see um, such development being discouraged altogether? So just no one would bother making nice things anymore. I don't, um, I think it wouldn't discourage people from, from creating kind of privatised public space. I think, um, the, I think the problem with it right now is that it's such a gray area. So you see something that looks like public space, but your rights of what you can actually do on that space are limited by who owns it and what invisible rules or um, a kind of policies they have around how you can inhabit that. Um, I think from conversations we've had with people in the private sector, they do seem to be quite amenable to um, to changing that, I think that um, the parameters of how we measure what is a successful space are changing um, and the metrics for that are also changing. So I think, um, whereas before a space like the high street would have been judged by like how much, how many things are being sold and um, based on transactions. Now more and more uh, developers are kind of interested in the footfall. So it's about how do you create a nice space where people can come together. And um, while, you know, that is serving their purpose in a very different way to how it serves the, pub the public's purpose. I think that there's more of an alignment in terms of how people can actually come together to occupy space in an interesting way, as opposed to ha needing to go to a space in order tra to transact. So what are kind of non-transactional ways that people can come together to exchange skills, exchange knowledge, um, and what are the types of spaces that enable that to happen? Uh, I, I think, sorry, Maddie. I was gonna, the metrics thing, I think, is really relevant discussion um, at the moment because 
up until now, everyone's sort of been looking at metrics sort of more financially, um, but increasingly there's more discussion about like the importance of mental health and well-being and how do you start to measure things like happiness indexes and as manager was saying, like developers starting to look at measuring footfall rather than commercial transactions because that helps them in, in different ways. And I think it's about getting everyone to sort of have see this broader uh, kind of understanding of, of the benefits of creating spaces um, that a wider portion like that everyone can use and the benefits of having more people um, who can access a space um, and yeah I think I think as well it's about getting people to realize um, the sort of dangers of creating just these generic spaces around the city and, and how important it is that they become um, sort of locally integrated and uh, reflecting a local context. I think in, I was familiarising myself recently with the King's Cross story, and uh, which involved lots of consultation in early stages. And one of the sort of anecdotes is that um, the developers sat down with the then mayor Ken Livingston and asked him, uh, "What would you know, this? What would it take to, to get you to support this as a pu public space?" And his question was, "If if I could take a demo through this public space, through or onto central London, then in my view, this is a public space. And if I couldn't," Then it's not a public space, and it kind of, that that was the kind of criteria. Now, obviously, um, I, I don't think anyone's ever tested that. Um, and but the thing is, is that how how do you actually get from a situation where a developer or somebody else starts with some ideas and then keeps those ideas or makes those ideas better, or do you risk that thing uh, any kind of development can start with good principles and then gradually be whittled down with the kind of introduction of facial recognition technology or uh, you know whatever kind of e extraordinary measures have to be introduced at a certain time uh, as you go along how do you actually create a kind of covenant almost like a um, uh, almost like a kind of constitution that keeps them going the public space charter uh, becomes really interesting for example because you've hit the nail on the head that right now there is nothing governing how these spaces um kind of progress and it and we need people need to be accountable to making sure that they continue to do what they were set out to do and it's important that spaces evolve but they need to evolve in a way that um you know is productive for the, for the local community and still allows them in and still allows them to use them in, in different ways um, and so things like the public space charter are really important in sort of holding different people um, to account to make sure that these spaces aren't abused and you don't have them um, sort of becoming increasingly private and stopping certain people coming in. And, and we'll be seeing unseen architecture doing lots of work on this along the way, of course. Yeah, so I just wanted to add that um, I think that the issue of transparency again becomes really important. So even with King's Cross, like, I think the problem with facial recognition isn't necessarily the technology, which isn't born bad. It's more the power structure behind that technology. So you have no idea like how that data is being captured and used and what it's being used for. And I think that part of what we're doing in the kind of ministry of uh, collective data is trying to understand how these kinds of things can be democratized. So I think there's no point in having all of these important, meaningful conversations at the beginning of the project if that isn't kind of seen through throughout its duration. And so how do architects get involved in the process earlier? Can they write better briefs? Can they stay involved over a longer period of time um, it, as a way to bring the kind of people who will eventually be using the space and the developers that are funding the space together in, an, in a different format? Um, and that's one of the things we're trying to experiment with in our practice, like how do you change the formats that, through which these discussions and these designs are kind of taking place through? Yeah, our structural engineer gave um, a really good example with the facial recognition, like of how technology um, it's, it's to do with how technology is used rather than perhaps the technology itself. So, for example, when you're waiting for a bus, um, you're perfectly happy to know the next bus is coming in five minutes. But at the same time, you, you'd find it really creepy if a bus driver knew that you were waiting at the bus stop. And so it's kind of thinking about like how how is it that this technology can be used in a way that that would be positive um, like which is probably about having more transparent ownership of it and it being more collectively owned um, at the moment it's not being used in a good way but are there possibilities for it to to do something else we've had quite a cool contribution someone says they've climbed over the fence of bedford square many of times have, have you ever done it I, I think i used the pavilion once when it was in the corner you just like put your feet on jump over um, Another quick question uh, we've got, um, 
So actually, this is something we haven't really uh, we haven't really touched on this much, uh, which is the um, the pandemic going on and the kind of interim and possible long term implications this might have for what we're discussing. So we've got a question from Maya Mystery. I'd like to give him an opportunity to ask it himself, but um, I'm going to pair it with another question from Vasu. Uh, Vasu's question is. Um, any um, is to do with the hospital being set up in Central Park, New York, and whether you had any reflections on that. And I'm going to patch in Maya now. Um, hello, can I? Can you hear us? Yeah. Okay. Can Would you, you like? Me? Yes, we can. Would you like to ask your question, please? Yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, thank you for such a great presentation. And uh, my question is like: recently, I was reading articles that uh, what are the added implications? Uh, after this pandemic about uh, like there might be some new rules and regulation in building code which uh, the government would require stricter norms for public space design or private space design. So what are the changes in design which you are expecting and what would be a new outlook towards uh, the design after this pandemic? Thanks. Um, I think they're really good questions. There's quite a few of them in the thread. I think Mark Rowe also had a really good one about the growth of the of the state in the last few weeks or as a result of the pandemic. Um, I mean, we found that really fascinating in that despite having a Tory government, we seem to have the welfare state returning. Um, and uh, and I, I don't know, it seems like an interesting opportunity in some ways to think about how the public sector can start to play a greater role role in the shaping of these spaces rather than I think just relying on private funds to make some of these public spaces happen but then on the other hand a lot of the spaces that were already under threat and were completely underfunded um, that are kind of essential to British culture like the high street and the pub are even more under threat now um, and a lot of kind of shop owners and pub landlords aren't sure if they can reopen um, following the crisis even with the support that the government is giving them so um, I think a lot of the topics we're exploring in the pavilion are really being put under question and are being highlighted as like these really important spaces for the community that need to be invested in, but also need to be rethought. So I think the pub maybe has been kind of pigeonholed into just a space for drinking, whereas it started as a kind of political space. It's often been a space where marginalized communities come together, but it has issues of access where people from different backgrounds don't always feel welcome to go in there and maybe there's too much of a focus around drinking um, and we need to kind of diversify what can happen in there and how it can be, be more of a community space. Um, whereas the high street needs to also be rethought um, to move away from retail and to maybe rethink how things that don't have any funding like the library or the post office or any of these spaces, like how can they um, start to provide other spaces for people to come together and like Studio Polpo, who we're working with in Sheffield, have got some really interesting case studies based on projects they've done on the Sheffield High Street that kind of take over vacant spaces as sites for knowledge exchange. Um, they've also tested how long you can stay in certain spaces without having to spend any money. Um, and they've worked on a project called Food Hall that's actually quite vibrant in terms of the community it attracts and how it's able to survive without necessarily always relying on monetary transactions, but rather serving as a kind of way for people to like learn new skills and contribute kind of new objects and and um, services to the community in other ways. Yeah, I think it's, um, I like, completely agree with everything Manish you just said, and I think it's about the value that these spaces bring and, and thinking about the value that they bring in more of kind of a social sense, um, rather than always thinking about these things financially, which seems to happen all too often. Um, and interestingly, like in, we found through our research that in places around the country um, that pubs have closed, there tends to be an increase in alcoholism. Um, so. Um, yeah, like the, re the relationship with the pub and drinking, like the pub actually, it, it brings much more to a community than, than just somewhere to go and drink. So it's, it's really about rethinking um, the value in, in these kind of typologies and their uses. Um, but also I think your question about the building codes is really interesting because I think what's really being highlighted right now, which people like architects have sort of said for years, but no one's really listened to us, is that um, sort of the housing that we're building is just totally inadequate. Like the space standards are completely inadequate. and the access that people have to outdoor spaces is completely inadequate. And that's why parks are getting so full of people because we don't have access to outdoor space. Now I live really near Victoria Park and it was really devastating that it closed. And suddenly the spaces around it become even more densely populated. 
um, with people trying to get their daily exercise. Um, and so I really hope there's more of a discussion about like, why is our, both our housing so inadequate, but also why is our access to outdoor space so inadequate when we know it's so important? It certainly seems like on the point of regulations, you could imagine an outcome of this would be stricter regulations, but at the same time, especially in this kind of context of this war language and the kind of immediacy and urgency, we're seeing huge amounts of flexibility, actually, and a lot of things are being used, not necessarily in the ways they were supposed to. Places are being repurposed, people are behaving in different ways and just getting on with it and having to, like for example, Central Park just being turned over to a temporary hospital. Um, and so that you could imagine that possibly one outcome of this in the sort of medium and long term as we get over it is actually people being a bit more flexible about public space, but adhering to better overarching principles, which is about health and well-being, mental health and physical well-being, and also just um, a sort of more holistic vision about what, what progress is and what these kind of amenities should be for, rather than strictly selling them off to use for temporary park events like festivals where the tickets cost £100 every summer. Um, so we, got, we can take some more questions. I think I can see one from a long running campaigner on public space issues, which is Will Jennings. Uh, I'm going to unmute you and allow you to ask your question, please. Uh, Will, are you there? Has he left? <laughs> Will? Will? He says he has no speaker. Okay, so I could, uh, I could read it out. Um, okay, so Will asks, um, are there any parallels to be drawn between POPs, and a POP is a publicly owned private space, if I've got it right, uh, and the current risk of losing the right to roam and national footpath network, which are frantically trying, which people are frantically trying to map right now. So uh, we know that in Scotland there's a right to roam and you can pretty much go anywhere uh, as long as you're not um, you know, causing, breaking certain rules about where you put your bonfire or whatever. Um, uh, whereas in Britain we don't have that where we have a national footpath network but all of these things are potentially uh, constantly having to fight for their existence. Uh, and Will goes on, it strikes me that notions of pops and the depublicizing um, space is not just an urban issue, but POPs is nearly always an urban and largely urban discussion. Uh, we also have another question as well on this, on this typic of the, uh, on the urban and rural, and they're saying, um, if I can find the question, actually I think I've lost it. Uh, it was something to do with um, how do you fund, how do you create a sustainable funding stream to maintain meaningful spaces such as country parks inside and outside of the city? Um, so, so starting with um, Will's question, um, which is a really great question. I think, so we're trying to almost move away from POPs in our understanding of privatised public space because I think up until now the discussion has really been centred around them um pops as these kind of I, I mean i'd agree these urban kind of spaces like these these new paved um squares and um i think we're trying to look at privatized public space in, in a broader sense as something um which has existed for for generations in the uk through things like the pub um and, and it's often within rural communities where these spaces are actually even more important um so uh we were looking at kind of how in areas where a lot of public funding has been cut to amenities like libraries and other uh, community centers the pub actually is taking on all of these additional programs and becoming that space for different the different groups that might need it um equally i think these like networks like you were talking about about footpaths and um that are under threat as well like they i think we they're, they're really important in terms of how we understand like the UK as well and I think that that's for us what was interesting about looking at this as a kind of an issue within the UK means that there were specific typologies we wanted to draw out across different scales and I think we have always seen the pavilion as a kind of platform to start addressing kind of lots of these different spaces and so part of doing discussions like this is also to, to figure out what are other things we should expand our focus to include um, so I think looking at these networks is, is really important but equally I think green space is an, because we were specifically in our room are looking at the garden square 
uh, I think in cities we often find that we want more green space, um, whereas actually sometimes, especially in economically deprived areas, the green space, the cost of maintaining it and um, ensuring it's safe can actually be more of a burden than a blessing. And so uh, we were actually talking to public works who were collaborating with um, about this in the really early stages. And they were saying that the answer can't always be a garden or a green space because um, the, the kind of infrastructure that you need to make that a properly used space is, is too much. And so I think what we're finding is that it's never a kind of binary and it's always, it's such a complex nuanced problem. It has to be specific to whichever place you're trying to intervene within. Okay, um, we've got a, uh, another question here uh, from uh, Shumi. I'm going to pat Shumi in and uh, if this works. Hello, would you like to ask your question to do with, I think, I believe it's to do with metrics. I wasn't really questioning it, but <laughs> it was <laughs> one of those really annoying people. It's not really a question. No, I guess I was just bringing up um, the issue of public space, it's often understood as one homogenous thing rather than there being several publics and the possibility of exclusions, um, whichever kind of public space you're trying to do. It wasn't really a question as such, I, I guess I was just replying to Freya who was looking for some thesis research and I was recalling a book called Publics and Counterpublics by Michael Warner which is excellent on that topic. Um, but to the ladies, um, how have you dealt with this issue of public space which tends to be dealt with at least on policy level as this one singular public that you're addressing as opposed to many fractured publics which you know is reality yeah it's um i mean it's it's really difficult uh, topic to engage with um and I, th I think that's almost what attracted us to it because we don't want to be put off by that um, and it almost feels like as soon as you consider one group, you're excluding another group. And um, I think that's why we think it's just so important to try and open up the discussion and to allow as many people to engage in this discussion um, as possible. I think how... Lang sorry. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Go, please, please, please tell me. No, I just think, I think language has, has been really important for us as well in terms of how do we make sure this topic is accessible to as many people as possible. And um, I think architects often, you know, use a lot of jargon and it means that pe a lot of the general public feel like they can't participate in the conversation around privatized public space. It's also why we don't like the acronym POPs because it isn't immediately clear what it's about. And it is also very specific, as Maddie said, to this one type of space. Um, and actually public space means a whole host of things globally but also within the UK it has really um, kind of historic origins and in quintessentially British spaces like the high street and the pub and other examples um, but also like looking at the, into the history of the state actually providing some of these spaces and then the kind of void left behind when they're no longer funding them and ways some of them have mutated in order to survive and others have just fallen by the wayside so um, I think richer understanding of like who these fractured publics are is going to help us understand like how we need to craft these spaces in order to serve them better but also that we do that together with the different publics if that makes sense yeah yeah in dialogue i guess would be the the ideal thing sorry i do have a, a sort of question that keeps occurring to me it's not necessarily you guys but maybe we can think about it together but um so Obviously, the, the luxuries or privileges that we're enjoying, some of us now, and those of us who have private outdoor space and all the kind of discussions, arguments, um, tipping points, one Guardian columnist says um, today, is about this kind of access to parks and um, the sort of value of shared public spaces like that. But I've been speaking to friends who have children um, who are now really suspicious of crowds and shared public spaces. And I guess I'm thinking forward to a time when we're gonna to have to mediate a sort of um, fear of public space and privilege of private space, which is absolutely what I think is, being, is, is happening right now. Um, I guess I'm kind of trying to cross pollinate with a question around density, which brings us to cities, because I grew up in a city which is extremely dense and um, you can't really have private space or distancing, certainly not private outdoor spacing in, in the city where I'm from. So I, I'm slightly fearful about um, 
how public space is going to recover, let's say, or the culture of public space is going to recover in this climate when we're all kind of scared of being close together or sharing space at all. Any thoughts? <laughs> Sorry to be bleak. Um, I think it is a real concern. I mean, I think both of us have been using parks in our local area for our, you know, one approved form of exercise a day. And um, mm. it's, it was kind of interesting in the day before the lockdown and a few days afterwards, the day before the lockdown, there were loads of people just kind of, even though we we're not technically supposed to be together, there were still people like meeting in kind of largish groups. And then a few days later, suddenly um, there was a very weird way people were kind of negotiating around each other. Like they were still using public space, but they were much more suspicious if you, if you ran past them or people were waiting if you were passing through a narrow kind of bridge or area. Um, and there's a kind of totally new dynamic to how people occupy these spaces. And I think it is, I don't think it's going to be as quick as we kind of went into this state to get out of it. I think it's going to be a much more slow process to understand how to kind of inhabit these spaces together. But they are really important, I think, in, in, in dense urban areas. Um, and I, I do agree with that article. I think it will be a tipping point if we're no longer allowed to use those spaces. I think a lot of my friends that have young kids that live in tiny apartments, it's really important that like, they actually wake up really early in the morning to just take their kids to run around in their nearest park so that they don't go crazy. Because I think for a child, like you don't even understand what's going on at the moment and you don't get to see your friends and you're cooped up all day. And I don't, I don't know, I think these the access to these spaces is important and maybe they need to be people just need to be more aware maybe of what they're at risk. I mean, um, it, it's very strange right now. I don't know if you can hear it in the background, but there are a group of kids playing on the street outside my window and they've been really loud all day, but it's like to the first day this has happened in ages and I don't know why. I've been getting um, full anxiety when I've been hearing more than three children outside, just like, go home, what are you doing? Exactly. Um, anyway, thank you so much for taking two questions. Yeah, I think like <laughs> what's happening right now thank is you. so huge, like, there will be a fundamental shift of, of you know, it, it's, it's massive. And I don't think any of us can really predict necessarily what, what that shift will be or, or what it will look like. But I think, yeah, it, it's, it's, it'll be really odd to be able to bump into someone on the street and be able to talk to them properly. Um, yeah. It's, there's that expression that um, there are decades where nothing happens and then there are days where decades happen. Uh, certainly, you know, with the theatrics of our, of our public spaces, our parks, our commons, uh, it, it seemed like it was a bit unchanging, you know, the dog walkers, the joggers, the cyclists, and then suddenly there is a total different kind of drama and spatial arrangement to it. And it does seem to reflect what's happening in the pages of the newspapers and on the television. So you one could imagine that in the coming days, Things will change. You know, they could continue to change quite radically, and hopefully, will some will will spin it just the right way, and then we'll come out of this with a really great settlement where everyone do, does feel happy going with their kids and elderly relatives, and, and all groups feel feel properly safe. Okay, here's a bit of a, here's a bit of like a non-architecty question, right? For you both, uh, what? Give me an example of a, of a of a privatized public space that you actually just genuinely join. And you really feel like it works for you. It doesn't have to be in London. Could be anywhere in the world. Um, but like, what, what do you actually like? You know, what are you happy with? What works? Um, <laughs> Is that a difficult question? I'll tell you, okay. I can tell you for me, I really like in London, I actually quite like the Bonington Square, uh, which is like a kind of squatted square that then became community owned and they have a cafe and all these plants. And so for me, the kind of the issue of genuineness comes from the actual community ownership of the land. And then, then from that comes a place that I think is genuinely inclusive and free. Yeah, I, th I think the South Bank is uh, a really interesting um, kind of space, like alongside the National Theatre um, kind of area, like um, the way that, for example, skateboarders have started to appropriate um, the undercroft um, of National Theatre. And to an extent, it's so important that when that was looked at being taken away, there were, there were huge kind of petitions and stuff. And, it's, it's almost become listed as part, as part of the fabric of that area. Um, and I think the most successful public spaces are almost the spaces that are used in ways that they were never intended to be used for. And they've been so so kind of claimed by the community um, who started to use them in ways that, that suit them. 
um, I, I think those are almost the most exciting spaces and it's almost about providing this framework that doesn't necessarily dictate what you can do but is flexible enough you can um, do a whole variety of activities. Yeah I was so, going to um, say like, the, the street I think that um, it's I think we, we don't always think of that as a public space, but I think in terms of how you can um, occupy it in different ways, your rights to protest and all these things that we sometimes take for granted or assume that we can do in anything that looks public. Um, I think it, it's more and more a space that like what we can actually do there is limited, but I think it's a really valuable Kind of it's interesting because the street was the original kind of playground as well for young kids like that was where they would play and then when the motor car came along it became quite dangerous but now I suppose now the roads are becoming quieter like you're saying manager you hear like kids playing on your street again and stuff and so like you know if, if things continue like this maybe we'll see the street being reclaimed in, in new ways and there's certainly ongoing discussions at the moment like um, with the onset of sort of autonomous vehicles and electric vehicles, what happens to the parking spaces on the street? Like who really owns those spaces? Um, are they owned by like the people and properties next to them or are they owned, you know, should they be more managed by the councils and do they become gardens or, or do they become an extension of the pavement? And um, yeah, I think the streets are a really interesting one. It's also one of the few spaces where people from like different points of view and different backgrounds still come together. And maybe they, it's not necessarily a space where conversation between those groups is happening. But one of the reasons we were interested in um, some of these more interior types of um, privatized public spaces was because traditionally they had been spaces of debate and discussion where you encountered people that didn't come from the same point of view as you and you were able to argue from different standpoints. And now it feels like the kind of filter bubbles of our digital lives is translating into our physical lives. And Or I don't know, maybe it happened the other way around. but we often go to places that are very homogenous in terms of who occupies them. And um, I mean, I live in an area where there's uh, two kind of quite, uh, I guess, traditional like religious communities that wouldn't otherwise mix. And they don't always mix even in on, it, like in the spaces that they occupy, but they do mix on the street and they kind of live in a parallel way. And it's kind of fascinating to observe that as someone else who also occupies those same spaces. So certainly, and it seems as though like I, I really enjoy what you said about debate spaces for debate because possibly the oldest public building in London is Westminster Hall, and then that is then part of the Parliament. And the Parliament obviously is a formal debating place, but it's also just a public debating place, a bit like St Paul's Cathedral, which was famous for having St Paul's Walk, which was the nave itself that people for centuries would walk along and just gossip. So that the cathedral in the centre of London was the centre of all of the gossip in London the same time and we really uh, and maybe it's just the streets or maybe it's the queue in Lidl or Sainsbury's or wherever it is it's certainly uh, the doorsteps and lots of places where people are talking now um, quick question from Bobby Jewell and he says uh, on the counter side of the my question are there any places you really dislike again doesn't have to be London doesn't have to be by any developers or architects listening right now uh, could be anywhere in the world uh, but any places where um, you feel uh, feel really uncomfortable, really out out of sorts. Um, I suppose I, I if for me it would it would probably be any kind of security clearance zone to get into a public building. Naturally, not going to feel that comfortable, is it? But it, where 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 is um, your least liked public the public slash private space? Um, I think maybe a lot of the spaces that um, in new developments. Um, that are branded as community centers or like town halls. There's like a lot of culture around branding spaces as uh, it comes out of this nostalgia for these like kind of publicly funded spaces, but you're immediately suspicious of them. And they, they're kind of very generic on program spaces that like talk about community in the most general terms. And as a result, end up being quite dead or being appropriated by kind of wealthy inhabitants of like a kind of luxury flats and um but they're named as though they're these really inclusive important spaces so i think that would be my worst one Maybe. yeah yeah i think i mean I, was, I mean i totally agree like anywhere that doesn't allow people access um but off the top of my head i when you said that question i was just like i really really hate westfield shopping center <laughs> but at the same time it's really really popular and so I think 
it's kind of like my gut reaction is like it stresses me out but at the same time it's really popular so I think we have to think like why is it popular like what are the things it's doing right and how do we take those things and create them in a space that's maybe better designed um that, that more people um can enjoy um and appreciate absolutely um it, just thinking i mean on the other the other rooms within the pavilion are there are there ones um, that we didn't really touch on in this discussion because i realized we were approaching the end of our allotted hour um is i mean in terms of the i mean one one interesting question we had right at the very beginning was is there a single and it relates to your common land room is there a single register of um of public spaces i think it was public spaces or was it privately owned space I think it was about unregistered spaces. Unregistered spaces, so that's it. So it's amazing, isn't it? These extraordinary bits of land everywhere and nobody knows who they uh, owns them, but I guess it's technically the queen overall. <laughs> <laughs> not, not always. I, I don't know, Public Works, who we're working with on that room, the Ministry of Common Land, has been doing a lot of interesting projects, um, trying to use the format of the real estate agency as actually a tool to help us understand, to give the public agency to kind of occupy gap sites in the city um, and I think developers like Roger Zagolovich have been looking at how do you actually develop gap sites in the city so there's kind of like people working at it from both sides but I, I'm, I don't think there's like a publicly accessible domain of it's it's really problematic because unless something's on the land registry as well you don't know who owns it and so yeah it's it's really impossible to to know and i think there are projects like who owns england where they're trying to map this and start it but it feels like it should be something that's available uh, publicly and and done by the government almost you know like it's, it's it's a resource that should be there for everyone like if you see a pocket of land and you can think of like an exciting use for it but you don't even know who owns it like who you even to have that conversation with it, it's a really big problem I think it, where I live in Wandsworth, there was a recent case where the local authority took ownership of a huge you know, graveyard. And so it was you know, several hundred years old, had been out of use in hundreds of years, and they wanted to restore it, which is a good, noble thing to do. But there was no documentation to prove who owned it either way. So they had to go through a complex process of basically saying to the world, do you own this? And then waiting a certain time for them to respond. It seems like most things that look a bit weird are probably not owned by anyone. Is that right? Or they've owned by somebody and you're just, who's forgotten that they own it or you know, <laughs> is no yeah. longer around. Um, it, there's so much, that, that it's such a gray area. I think like, I think what we've, ironically, the painting was our starting point in terms of understanding privatized public spaces as middle ground between these two extremes. But so many of the spaces we've encountered since sit within this kind of weird middle ground. Um, as Maddie said, like, you know, Westfield is, you know, you can easily write that off as like a bad space, but then um, one of the rooms deals with teenagers who really need that space. Similarly, like we taught a workshop in a Weatherspoons, which we were prepared to hate because um, they kind of supported the Brexit campaign and um, were using... The, the like, workshop was about like, Brexit, yeah, and they yeah, asked us to the workshop about the role of privatized public space uh, yeah. in Brexit. Yeah. But um, in the end, when we were there over the duration of like four hours, um, it was used by such a diverse group of people. And also we were there with like 20 other pe uh, 20 students and it, it only cost us ATP to have like unlimited refills of tea and no one moved us on. We had free Wi-Fi. So I guess we're finding it hard to like actually like say it, something is good or bad. I think there's a kind of there's so many ways in which you can interpret that in between and there's so many degrees of separation within that. Well, well so it sounds like what we're hearing is that there's lots more topics contained within the pavilion that we might need to revisit in some later 100 day studio installments, uh, perhaps focusing on some of the other rooms because we did the, gar the main room really well today, Garden Square. I think I'd like to thank everybody who asked questions who had really fantastic engagement today. I uh, really appreciate everybody and um, who asked the question and also I'm sorry if I didn't get to um, to bring anybody on the chat box into the conversation. Uh, I'm just learning this. Um, but I would say you've been listening to day two of the 100 day studio uh, with, with Maddie and Manager from Unseen Architecture. Um, tomorrow's uh, installment is Luke Jones and Christopher Berman uh, and it's entitled Deep House Methods for Modelling uncertainty 
and that's at one o'clock, so it's a different time. And then in the evening, uh, it's Tony Fretton uh, talking about form and facades, and that's at seven. And then after that, there's a bedtime story, uh, which I believe is on Instagram Live rather than Zoom, and that is read by Maria Smith. Uh, she's reading a text uh, by Will Self called Between uh, the Conceits. So what I'm going to do, I would like to say, Thank you to both of you for really fascinating insight. We're very much looking forward to the public space crawl and very much looking forward to the pavilion. And I'm going to unmute everyone so we can uh, give our appreciation to you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>